A guide to growing sunflowers. They're not just beautiful. Many sunflowers are also edible. Their seeds, of course, make for a great healthy snack. But some varieties also produce tubers, underground stems, that can be cooked and enjoyed in many different dishes. Sunflower varieties. Russian giant and mammoth Russian. These plants grow to at least 10 feet tall and sometimes as tall as 15 feet. They usually have one large flower head that's about a foot across. Kong. Similar to the Russian giant, this variety can reach 10 feet tall or higher, with heads that are one foot across. This variety has a habit of branching and will produce multiple flowers per plant. Sunspot. A shorter variety, this plant reaches two feet tall and has flower heads that are about 10 inches wide. Here are the steps for direct sowing for sunflowers. Step one, space seeds about six inches apart in a shallow trench, about one to two inches, 2.5 to five centimeters deep. When planting in sandy soil, two inches deep works best. Step two, cover the seeds and keep them watered until they sprout, which typically takes seven to 10 days. Step three, sow a new row every two to three weeks to enjoy continuous blooms until the first frost. Note, depending on the variety that's being grown, sunflowers will mature and develop their seeds in 80 to 120 days. Transplanting. Step one, when starting sunflowers indoors, use separate compartments of a seeding tray. Step two, fill the tray with potting mix and plant each seed so that about a half inch of the mix covers the top of the seed. Step three, then water the soil until it's moist and keep it moist as the seedlings grow. Step four, also, it's important to maintain the soil's temperature around 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 to 23 degrees Celsius. Sunflowers will thrive in slightly acidic to somewhat alkaline soil, usually with a pH between 6.0 to 7.5. Their ideal soil temperature for germination is between 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 30 degrees Celsius, and they need sunlight to germinate. Seeds should sprout in about 10 to 14 days. Sunflowers grow best in spots that get direct sunlight, roughly six to eight hours a day. They also need long, hot summers to flower. Thinning. When the first true leaves appear, thin sunflower plants to about two feet apart. Staking. Though there are a few sunflower varieties that don't need staking, it's a good idea to support any plants that grow over three feet tall or are multi-branched. Plant a stick, or a long metal piece, vertically beside the plant's stem, attaching one to the other. Tie the plants loosely to these stakes with bits of cloth or other soft material as needed. Watering. Sunflower roots spread widely and can withstand some drought, but the flowers should still be watered regularly during their most important growth period, about 20 days before and after flowering. Deep regular watering helps to encourage their root growth which is especially helpful when growing taller sunflower varieties that have top-heavy flowers. Weed control. Sunflowers are a strong competitor with weeds, especially for light, but they don't cover the ground early enough to prevent those weeds from starting. That's why it's important to control any weeds in the early season to get good yields from sunflowers. Pollinators. Bees are super important for a sunflower's yield. 
they carry pollen from plant to plant, which results in cross-pollination. Pinching. With the thumb and forefinger, pinch out the plant's tip after four leaves have grown. This process will double or triple the number of flowers per plant, although the flowers will be smaller in size. Fertilizing. Sunflowers are heavy feeders, so their soil needs to be nutrient rich with organic matter or composted aged manure. Since they grow quite vigorously, sunflowers can easily grow six feet in just three months. It's a good idea to add some slow-releasing granular fertilizer about eight inches deep into the soil, especially if it's poor and thin. The better their diet, the larger the flowers. Avoid adding too much nitrogen because it will delay flowering. When the plants are 30 centimeters, 12 inches tall, dissolve five milliliters, one teaspoon of borax for boron in 350 milliliters, 12 fluid ounces of water and spread this solution over five meters, 15 feet of row. By adding boron, it'll help the plants produce big seeds and flower heads. Just be careful not to over apply it and don't use it on other garden plants. Mulching. By spreading a two to three inch mulch layer on the soil, it retains moisture while also discouraging weeds from growing. Use organic material like wood chips, shredded leaves, grass clippings, or compost. When the sunflower seedlings reach four to five inches, 10 to 12 centimeters in height, they can be transplanted as long as the weather outside is ideal. Sunflowers shouldn't be transplanted until any chance of an overnight frost has passed for the season. Note, letting a sunflower grow any taller than a few inches before transplant can weaken their plant structure. Because of this, try not to start sunflower plantings until late enough in the spring that they can be transplanted as soon as they reach the right height. Sunflower seeds, leaves, and stems emit substances that can prevent the growth of certain other plants. They should be separated from potatoes, bush beans, and pole beans for this reason. Raised beds. Sunflowers have long tap roots that need to stretch out. So when preparing a raised bed, dig down two feet in depth and about three feet across. Containers, Big Smile, Elf, Pacino, Sundance Kid, Sunspot, and Teddy Bear are some of the varieties that will grow well in containers. Large sunflowers grow deep, tuberous roots, so only plant small varieties in smaller containers, under 10 inches wide. As with most container growing, fertilizer needs to be added to provide the soil with enough nutrients. Ideally, organic and slow-release fertilizers are the best ones to use. Banded Sunflower Moth Its larvae, caterpillars, feed on the flower heads and also feed on pollen, which affects the important pollination process of sunflowers. Silk-like webbing on sunflower heads is typically a sign that these larvae are feeding on the plants. Here's what to do. Cultural control methods, like tillage and planting crops early, have both been effective ways to reduce the amount of damage from banded sunflower moths. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on new plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. 
and pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Ligus bug. These pests will feed on developing seeds, which can then cause kernel brown spot. When a plant is affected with kernel brown spot, there will be small brown to black spots on the blunt end of sunflower seeds. Here's what to do. Certain insecticide treatments can help reduce feeding damage when the insecticides are applied at the beginning of the flowering process. Sunflower beetles. Adult beetles, as well as the larvae, will feed on sunflower plants, which can cause poor seed set and seed filling, delayed maturity, and reduced yields. Here's what to do. Natural predators usually keep sunflower beetle populations below damaging levels. Sunflower beetle eggs are eaten by lady beetles, while the larvae of the common green lacewing will eat both the sunflower beetle eggs and larvae. Damsel bugs and the two-spotted stink are also known to eat these pesky beetles. Sunflower maggots. There are three main species that will feed on sunflowers and cause the sunflower's seeds to become sterile or the sunflower's stalks to break. Typically, this damage happens when there are high numbers of sunflower maggots on a plant. Otherwise, the damage is usually not that serious. What to do? There aren't currently ways to manage this particular pest. So it's best to follow other pest control methods like avoiding wet soil, keeping weeds in check, and practicing crop rotation to avoid a sunflower maggot problem. Sunflower midge. The larvae of this pest can affect the growth of sunflower heads. Heavily damaged heads become gnarled and cupped inward and sunflowers won't produce as many seeds as they normally would. Here's what to do. Delayed planting can help avoid the first major appearance of overwintering midges, i.e. ones that have survived the winter. But later infestations can still be severe. Some commercial hybrids of crops are tolerant or resistant to the sunflower midge, so it's best to consult the local agricultural representative for more localized information on the most resistant varieties of plants that are available. Sunflower seed weevils. The larvae of this pest will feed on kernels, causing seeds to not fully develop while also lowering the seed's oil content. Oftentimes, the kernels are only partially eaten, making it quite tricky to separate healthy seeds from those that are weevil damaged. Here's what to do. Early planting helps to reduce seed damage because sunflowers will have completed their flowering when planted early. That means they'll no longer be susceptible to egg laying during peak weevil populations. Fall or spring disking can also help fight off these pests. For the most part, insecticides, sometimes in combination with trap cropping, are typically the best way to manage these weevils and to reduce their damage. Sunflower stem weevils. There are two main stem weevil species, the spotted sunflower stem weevil 
and the black sunflower stem weevil. These pests typically weaken sunflowers' stems and occasionally can cause substantial yield loss, so there won't be as many successful sunflower plants. Here's what to do. By delaying planting, it can help to reduce the amount of larvae in the stem. Fall tillage practices, which either bury or break up sunflower stalks, will also help to kill off the stem weevil larvae over the winter. Natural enemies of the stem weevil, like certain wasps, also help to keep them in check. Wireworms. The larvae of this pest feed on germinating seeds or young seedlings, especially feeding on the roots of plants. The stems of young seedlings may emerge shredded, while damaged plants are likely to wilt and die soon after becoming infected. Wireworm infestations are more likely to happen where grasses, especially perennials, have been growing. These pests mature after two to six years and will then appear brown in color and about one inch long. Here's what to do. If the risk of wireworm damage is high, Seeds can be treated with an approved insecticide to protect them while germinating and to further protect them as seedlings. Crop rotation, weed control, cover crop planting, and companion planting are also important ways to help lower the risk of damage done by pests in general. Finally, the use of row cover slash insect netting can also help to control wireworms. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions, causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease resistant seeds when possible and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water, or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves, Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants. 
and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Powdery mildew. Small white patches will appear on the upper and lower leaf surfaces, which might also show some purple blotching. Patches often come together to form a dense powdery layer, coating the leaves and causing the leaves to curl inward. In some cases, eventually the leaves will drop from the plant. Typically, the white patches start on the older leaves and then eventually spread to other plant parts. Powdery mildew is brought on by high humidity and moderate temperatures, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 to 27 degrees Celsius, with symptoms becoming most severe in shaded areas. As well, this disease often acts as an entry point for other pests and diseases. Here's what to do. First, Rotate crops so that members of the same family aren't planted in the same spot year after year. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. Plant disease-resistant varieties when possible, and then provide good air circulation by not crowding the plants and by eliminating weeds. Water plants in the morning to give them enough time to dry out, taking care not to get the plant's leaves wet. Consider spraying infected plants with certain protectant, preventative fungicides. Sulfur, lime sulfur, neem oil, and potassium bicarbonate are all effective, but these remedies will work best when they are used before the infection happens or when signs of the disease are first spotted. Instead of chemical fungicides, plants can also be sprayed with a bicarbonate solution by simply mixing one teaspoon of baking soda in one quart of water. Make sure to spray the plants thoroughly, since the solution will only kill fungi that it comes into contact with. Also, potassium bicarbonate, which is similar to baking soda, can actually eliminate powdery mildew once it's there and does the job fairly quickly. As well, after the growing season, make sure to dispose of any infected leaves or fruit. Once plants are heavily infected with powdery mildew, it's difficult to get rid of the disease, so focus on preventing it from spreading to other plants. Verticulum wilt. A disease causing the yellowing and wilting of lower leaves. Also, V-shaped brown lesions will appear, and the plant's roots and stems will also turn brown. Infected leaves wilt, dry out, and eventually die, while the stems of plants might also turn black near the soil line. In general, verticulum wilt can cause the wilting, stunting, or even the death of plants entirely. The disease is typically spread between plants when infected plant material is physically moved from one spot to another. Here's what to do. Plant high quality disease-free seeds and avoid planting in areas that were previously infected with verticulum wilt. It's also important to practice crop rotation with non-vulnerable plants. In general, a three-year crop rotation is a good place to start. As well, make sure plants have enough space in between, 
since air circulation and ventilation is very important for avoiding disease. Do not over fertilize or over water plants. And when watering is done, it's best to do so in the morning to give plants time to dry off during the day. Also, sterilize any containers before use. When there are plants infected with verticulum wilt, be sure to remove and destroy the plants and also destroy the surrounding soil. It's also important to control weeds around the crops. Water crops regularly, and when possible, provide crops with some afternoon shade. The verticulum wilt fungus can also be rid from the soil by using the solarization process. Simply cover the soil with a tarp, which will heat up the top six inches, 15 centimeters of soil, enough to kill the fungus. Harvesting. For seeds. Let the flower dry, either on or off the stem, until the back of the head turns brown, the leaves turn yellow, the petals die down, and the seeds look plump and fairly loose. To harvest seeds ahead of birds and squirrels, cut off the seed heads with a foot or so of the stem still attached. Then hang the heads in a warm, dry place that is well ventilated and protected from rodents and bugs. Keep the harvested seed heads away from humidity to prevent mold from spoiling them. Then they should be left to cure like this for several weeks. Once the seeds are totally dry, dislodge them by rubbing two heads together. You can also try brushing them off with your fingers or a stiff brush. Storage For seeds Allow them to dry for a few more days. Then store the seeds in airtight glass jars in the refrigerator to keep their flavor.